Right, so my name is Jakub Rozek. I work for Red Hat. I mostly work on the SSD. Um, there's my Twitter account. If there's no time for questions, you can just tweet me or meet me somewhere here in the hallways. Um, I also put uh, the little scripts I will be showing in the demos on my GitHub, and there's also a copy of the presentation in PDF, so we can grab it, read later. Um, this talk is about SSD, but it's not about the things that most people use when they use SSD, which is normally login as a user from Active Directory, LDAP, whatever. But it's about the parts that we are that are not as well known. They are very often in development, not so stable. Um, there is few topics. I will be going quite fast, not into many details. So, if uh, if you are interested in any details that I'm not going to cover, yeah, feel free to catch me later. Um, in particular, I'll be talking about the APIs that SSD has, how you can talk to SSD from a program, why it, it might be a good idea to let SSD handle local users from its password and group, uh, why and how SSD handles smart card logins, because as we heard, pump PKCS level is, is dead. And the last topic is, uh, how can SSD manage Kerberos tickets? I'm not sure even if I'm going to go to the last topic because we'll see how, are we, how we are with time. All right. First topic is uh, SSD APIs. How, do, how can you talk to SSD from your program? The first thing is why might you even want to do something like this? And the primary use case is that there are applications, quite a few of them actually, that implement some sort of an uh, LDAP driver or LDAP connector. Typically, this is because the application wants to use, uh, wants to let people log in with their LDAP credentials or whatnot, and use uh, data about these users. For example, the application might want to know which groups is the user member of to make some policy decisions, or the application might want to, for example, know the email address of the user to display it in the UI. Um, this sounds easy, and it's easy to do it uh, in some sort of trivial way. You just bind to LDAP, read the data, display it. But doing it correctly, there are a lot of details that you might even not you might not even know about the problems in the first place, much less to solve them. And uh, some uh, some of the problems are stuff like which server should I talk to? Uh, we already heard about uh, Active Directory sites. Uh, if one LDAP server goes down, what does the application do? It should in the ideal case, connect to a different server. Um, what if the LDAP server is, what if the network is completely down? In that case, you might want to keep serving some data from, from your cache. Um, in, in, in general, SSSD is a kind of expert in how to talk to LDAP. And it might be a good idea, instead of doing your own thing in your, in your application, just let SSD do its thing and provide you with an API that your application uses. Um, of course, it's already possible to talk to, to SSD somehow. If you just have SSD to uh, log in as, as an LDAP user, you can already run get and password -y, your username. It will display the user. This is already talking to SSD, right? But it's not a kind of publicly available API. In the case that I said in the get and password user, um, you talk to an uh, uh, interface that is called NSS, uh, name service switch, uh, which inside calls the uh, libc function get pw name, which then talks to, uh, to SSD through uh, function that SSD provides, the NSS SSS get pw name. Uh, this is not trivial to call directly from the application. It's somehow possible you can DL open the library and DLC in the functions and then call them, but that's really awkward. And it's not really flexible. So if you call this, this interface, the get pw name, you only get a fixed set of attributes. You only get the Username, uh, home dear, shell, and so on. But I had the example with the email address. It's not there. Um, so the way you can talk to SSD di directly already in the versions that are released is currently through a Dbus-based API. Uh, we chose Dbus for several years ago because of some advantages we saw that uh, primarily, there are many language bindings for SSD, uh, for, for Dbus, sorry. Um, I'm going to show some uh, little demo that will use Python. 
Um, Dbus is type safe. Dbus has, has types. So if you uh, request a number, for example, the UID number, uh, you get back a number. You don't get back a string that probably contains numbers, but maybe not. Um, Dbus has some uh, advanced features that might be useful, like uh, you can get notifications, which are, which are called signals in Dbus lingo. Uh, this can be useful if you have a um, UI and you don't want to continuously pull uh, SSD for if anything changed. You just get a signal when uh, the thing changed. You can redraw your UI. As we found out through bug reports and through feedback, uh, not everybody likes Dbus. There are disadvantages. The primary one we saw was that it requires a system bus, uh, the, the message bus running the broker. Uh, that's, for example, not available in containers. Uh, some language bindings uh, were not really great, and we only found out where people started trying to use the Dbus API. Um, I think the Java bindings were even unmaintained at the time where one project started to use them. But nonetheless, this is used by, uh, by several projects already. Uh, many of them are Red Hat-based because we talk to the people directly, like Manage IQ, Keycloak, which I think they had a presentation earlier today, uh, the Apache module, one lookup identity. Because of the problems we encountered with Dbus API, we thought if maybe it might be appealing to offer some other kind of API, but we never did it. We thought about REST because that's what many people are used to. It's easy to use. And we even talked about um, offering the LDAP protocol over LDAP. But yeah, this is really just discussions. We, this talk is about uh, SSD doing more than LDAP client, but I'm not sure if we want to do LDAP server. Yeah. Um, a little demo time. So I will be showing two scripts. One is written in raw Python LDAP, which Michal is maintaining. And the other is doing exactly the same thing, except it's talking to the uh, Dbus API of SSD. So let's see here. Here. So I'm going to run the first script, which is using the raw Python bindings. And what the script does is that it uh, finds the user who I uh, put on the command line as an argument, and it would print their email and their group membership. Right, so boom. We have we we know that the FOSDEM 2018 user has the email of FOSDEM 2018 at FOSDEM, and he's a member of three groups. So I'm going to really quickly show the script. Um, it's not ideal on this small screen, but you can see that even in the script, I have the uh, the user who I authenticate as, and I have the the password of the user in the script, which is really not ideal. <laughs> and there is lot of parsing and you know, low-level LDAP stuff that probably as application developer you don't want to know. So the script is about 70 lines long, right? So now I'm going to run the script that does the same thing, except it's using the SSD API, right? It returns the same data, except I think the groups are in a different order, which is kind of accept, uh, expected with LDAP. So if you look at the Dbus example, it's about half the size. <laughs> and more importantly, I think it, the language is quite, kind of more natural. So uh, requesting the email attribute is calling a method that is called get user attribute. Requesting the groups is calling a method that is called get user groups. You really don't get down to the raw LDAP level. Um, right, that's all about the first part about the Dbus APIs, details. <laughs> Um, if you want more details, catch me later. The next section is about managing local users and how does SSD relate to group, uh, users and groups in the HC files. Again, why do you want, might want to do this at all? Um, the, one of the reasons is uh, faster access to the, uh, to the files that, that are, uh, the users that are stored in the files on the disk. Uh, traditionally, you could use NSCD which is a name service caching daemon that comes from libc. But what we found out through the way of bug reports from users is that um, people who used NSCD because they wanted to have faster access to users on the disk, but they also used SSD because of uh, some remote users in LDAP, 
uh, they were complaining about these two uh, caching mechanisms not really playing well together. Right? And SCD sits kind of in front of SSD, and uh, the caching was really unpredictable. Um, I showed the APIs previously. Another reason why we might want to use uh, SSD for local users is that the APIs that I showed might actually be used also for local users if SSD is serving them in the first place. And then we could have a nice API for user, m not management, but reading user, user uh, information uh, on Linux for all kinds of users, be it remote or local. Um, SSD uses a database to, to store the, uh, the user data. Database comes from Samba, it's called LDB. And in the database, it's, it's possible to store additional attributes. So we were thinking about storing stuff like uh, maybe the keyboard layout or your preferred language in the database. And then this information could be, through the DBus API, uh, offered to whoever is interested in them. Uh, desktop environment, for example. And the last reason is smart cards for local users. SSD, in order to, be po to uh, authenticate some users, it must first know about them, therefore SSD must be uh, serving the local users. I'll have a separate section on the smart cards later with a demo. So uh, this is already kind of underway in Fedora, if you're running Fedora, since the Fedora 26 version. Uh, SSD is running by default on all, in all installations, and it is uh, mirroring the contents of ITC password and ITC group. We have an iNotify watch that kind of updates the database and drops all caches if uh, anything changes. Um, the way the caching works is that if there is a request coming from application like LSL wants to convert the uh, number to, uh, to name, uh, the request goes first to SSD. The first request goes to the daemon, which is a little slow, but then the daemon as part of the reply, puts the, the reply into a uh, memory mapped cache. So any subsequent uh, request would not even hit the daemon. It would just be uh, in the NSS module, which is loaded into the memory space of whoever is calling it. Um, as I said, the reason we're doing this is that this way, caching for local users interoperates easily with, whoever, uh, with, with SSD that might also be running on the same machine and serving users from LDAP. Disadvantage, SSD is bigger, fatter, more complex than NSCD. If you just care about local users and nothing else, you might just be happy with NSCD. There's nothing wrong about it. And the other, uh, the other uh, disadvantage is that this actually, in order for this to work, we had to revert the order of the NS switch conf modules. So traditionally, files was always first in the NS switch conf database. In Fedora since 26, we reversed it, so SSD comes first. Uh, this does not require SSD to be running at all. It doesn't require SSD to be installed. If uh, the SSS module finds out that the daemon is not running, it will just uh, gracefully fall back. So you know, if SSD is not running and you want to access root, it would work. Uh, so this is very much work in progress. The next thing we want to do is improve the smart card integration. You'll see later why it is currently very user unfriendly. Uh, we want to make it possible to extend the local database with more uh, attributes like the uh, keyboard layout or whatnot that I s uh, talked about. Currently, it is somewhat possible. We have a command line tool that is called SS override, but currently it only allows you to add a uh, uh, public certificate to, uh, for the smart card authentication. But right now, there's no general API or command line tool. Uh, there were some people who wanted us to extend the DBus API to allow write modifications. This, I think, came from Cockpit. So if you had some kind of create user method on the DBus API, it would call to lip user and create the user locally. Um, and as I said, we would like to have a unified API for uh, providing information about local and remote users. So what we're thinking about is to merge with this project from Free Desktop's account service and kind of implement or offer the same API from SSD. Hopefully this would happen this year, but uh, this is kind of project that we've been working on for a long time. It never, we have never had the time. That was local users. The next section is smart cards with SSD for 
primarily for local users. So I'm not a smart card expert by any stretch. Uh, the previous Jakub who had a talk right before me is, there's a link to his talk. He also gave the, a similar talk on a different conference last week or two weeks ago. The second link is to a recording of his talk. If you haven't seen it, you can. Um, I even didn't write this part of SSD. I really literally learned it as I was preparing this talk, but I can illustrate what's, how it works. So uh, traditionally, if you wanted to use uh, smart cards and log in as a local user with smart card, you would use PUM PKC less 11. It has a lot of features. It was super stable, but there's also no development. I think the primary developer abandoned the project and nobody else stepped up. Um, it even doesn't build against recent OpenSSL versions. And for that reason, it was dropped for Fedora. So currently in Fedora, there's no way to authenticate, I think, as a local user within the smart card. Um, kind of in parallel to that, SSD was gaining support for smart card users, which wasn't in, at first meant for local users. Uh, it was meant for remote users. The primary use case was free IPA and trust with Active Directory. Um, the way it works on a very, very high level is that uh, the, the uh, certificate is stored in the directory. Uh, if a smart card is inserted, then uh, the uh, SSD runs a search against and tries to find based on the, on the, on the certificate, tries to match the user and then uh, either does a PK in it, so Kerberos authentication with a, uh, <coughs> with a, uh, with a key, or uh, does kind of a local authentication and just on that machine. It's functional for local users. I'm going to show you. I would not call it usable by any way because it requires a bit of uh, manual configuration. So. First, SSD must be serving the local users, which is already default in Fedora, but I think not <coughs> elsewhere. Um, the uh, smart card can, doesn't have to be a real smart card. It can be anything that implements the uh, PKCLS 7 interface. I'm going to use a YubiKey for my demo. Uh, you need to load the certificate into the user database with the SS uh, override tool. I'm not going to show this because I don't have the time. And most importantly, the authentication, even though it's a local user, must be handled by PAM SSS, not PAM Unix. Uh, we haven't really thought through how to change the PAM stack in Fedora to make this possible in kind of generic way, but uh, I'll, I'll show a demo. Uh, this is something we will be working for Fedora 29 to make it more user friendly and everything should work by default, but we are not there yet. Right, demo time. So this is a VM. I wrote a simple program that just runs a pump conversation and uh, authenticates a user. So first, I'm going to authenticate a user called test. All right. So hopefully, I can write the password down. OK. So the user was authenticated. If we look at the journal. Um, the first line here is from audit, and it says that PAM, authentications, PAM authentication was successful, and the grantor, the module that uh, allowed the authentication, was PAM Unix. So this is what you do normally, authentication against its C shadow. So now I'm going to run um, second authentication. And as you can see, this time I was prompted for um, not for uh, password, but for PIN. And I don't remember the PIN. I have it here in the. <laughs> this is not secure. Don't do this, except if you are demoing <laughs> something on FOSDEM. Good that you mentioned that. Four, seven, two, three, one. And I was authenticated. So PAM authenticate uh, return success, right? And I'm going to show the journal again. And there is user auth, right? So user was authenticated. And it was authenticated by PAM SSS. And the user I was using was called local smart card test. And if we look into Etsy shadow, you can see that there's, there's something missing, right? There is no hashed password for this user. So I couldn't have authenticated against ATC password with a 
uh, at cshadow with a password, even if I wanted to. If we look at the first user I was using, right? There's a password. <coughs> Okay, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, a few, few more? Yeah, we have like 12 minutes. Good. So I'm going to run the last section, which is uh, why it might make sense to let SSD handle our Kerberos tickets. So I will not go into, detail on, uh, into details on Kerberos, but for the purpose of this, let's just say that if you authenticate against the Kerberos KDC, you get back a ticket. It's a blob, um, blob of data, and uh, this blob of data must be stored somewhere. That somewhere is called credential cache in Kerberos speak. There are several options. Uh, the easiest one is that you can just write that blob into a file. Uh, you can write that into a directory that can subsequently contain multiple credential caches for multiple Kerberos principles. You can put it into Kerberos Keyring, which is the default on Fedora and in RHEL, or you can use KCM. This is what the, uh, this part of talk is about. Um, I should mention that KCM is not my idea. It's not our team's idea. It comes from the Heimdall Kerberos distribution. I looked at the Git logs as I was preparing the talk, and the first commits for the KCM part uh, of Heimdall are more than 10 years old. Uh, the idea behind the KCM credential uh, cache is that it's not unlike the files, which you just put a blob right into the file, right? That's it. Here, the credentials are handled by a daemon. And uh, the advantage of this is that the daemon, because it's kind of active component, it can then do uh, things with a, with a credential cache that, uh, like, I will, I will get to the details later, but there's more functionality you get out of this. Um, if, you, if you will read some documentation about KCM, uh, the terminology is that the KCM daemon that is managing the credentials is called a KCM server. The tools uh, that, uh, or the, 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 whoever is talking to the uh, KCM daemon, typically it's some command line tools like knit or an application that uses libcurve 5 is referred to as a client. Um, even though there is a server and client, there's no network communication. Uh, it, it's all local communication over a Unix socket. Um, at the moment, Heimdall implements the KCM server. MIT doesn't. MIT only implements the client part. So MIT implements the support for this KCM uh, protocol over the Unix socket uh, for the tools, but not the server. Uh, you can mix and match them, and that's how I was testing our the KCM implementation. I was using uh, KCM uh, server from Heimdall against uh, KNIT from MIT, and it worked. I'm not sure if it would work in some production environment, but it worked for me. So why would you want to do this? As I said, the KCM daemon is stateful, so we can do things like renew the Kerberos credentials. Uh, Kerberos, uh, the credentials you get back in the, in the C cache have a limited time, but sometimes that time is not enough. For example, if you're running some batch job on some, some cluster, uh, that job might take longer than the lifetime of the credentials. What, the, what a daemon like ACM can do is renew the credentials for some time. Uh, again, notifications, that's one of the things we want to do. Uh, if the credentials are acquired, <laughs> about to expire, have been renewed, you can send a notification. We, are, we would like to use the DBus API that I was talking about earlier. And uh, I think GNOME was already uh, interested in using these notifications for the desktop environment. Uh, you, can also <coughs> sorry. you can also do things like if uh, the user who was using these credentials logs out, uh, you can get a notification from LoginD and wipe the credentials out. The credentials are also not written to the disk which might be beneficial for uh, sharing the credentials between two processes, because if they are on disk, they need to be in a predict predictable location, and this might not be super secure. Uh, what we also wanted to do is this way make Kerberos usable for containerized environments. Uh, 
the way we thought this would work out is that because the KCM server has a Unix socket, then you can run a KCM server in a container, and then if you have other containers that are maybe running some applications, those containers can bind mount the Unix socket of the KCM server, and this way you can share the credentials only between selected containers. Uh, unlike, for example, the keyring, kernel keyring, which is shared uh, between everyone. What we found out uh, is that nobody's really interested in using Kerberos with containers for various reasons. I think mostly... Really? <laughs> awesome. We can talk afterwards. Okay. So one person only is interested in using <laughs> Kerberos with containers. Um, cool. So uh, the implementation of uh, the KCM server in SSD is called SSD KCM. Uh, it reuses a lot of SSD code, which is one of the reasons uh, it lives in the SSD code base, but it doesn't need the rest of SSD. You don't need to have SSD serve any, local, uh, any users, even local or remote. You can just system control enable the KCM socket and then it works. Um, we are also in, planning to use some private API, uh, APIs of SSD. Again, another reason why this is a project inside the SSD umbrella for features like notifications and so on. KCM is the default Kerberos C cache since Fedora 27. Um, there are bugs, though. Uh, some are still open. I didn't really have that much time to look into them, but I will in the next couple of weeks. The current version of what we have in Fedora is just equivalent to the other C cache types. Uh, we don't really have implemented the features like the renewals, notifications, and uh, this. But we are going to. It's on my to-do list for Fedora 29. Um, if you want to learn more about KCM, there is a, a design page on the SSD wiki. And uh, there is a uh, link to the MIT Kerberos wiki page, which describes much more details about, for example, the protocol that uh, the libraries use. That's all. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I would like to ask about the caching uh, of uh, SSD in the sense that how often is generated and in case, for instance, the server goes down and the uh, ROS connection is the identity management, uh, how long will it be done? And the cache? Yes. Uh, as long as SSD stays offline. So if SSD is offline, it never removes anything from the cache. It will just serve cache data. And if you log in with the cached credentials in that case, you don't get a ticket. So it's just local authentication. And then, uh, for example, if, repeat the question, um, how, long is SSD, uh, how long is SSD cache valid? So uh, one interesting case there might be that SSD is offline. At that time, the administrator removes for example, remove some of your group memberships, right? Uh, the next <coughs> authentication that would happen online would refresh the cache data, but as long as you can't reach the server, the cache just stays the same. Uh, it's configurable, and there are two answers to this. One is that for just if you run something like get and password or ID from the command line, there is, uh, I think, 45 minutes or 30 minutes, something like this. But if you log in, as uh, Volker already said before, login is the only time where you can get uh, precise group information. At that time, we never use the cache. We always uh, process the reply from the server. Uh, I have a question that sort of relates to that um, in terms of debugging SSSD and PAM and knowing where a problem is and knowing when a cache has expired or when uh, SSSD probably has issues contacting the server. What are the typical ways of, of debugging SSSD? Um, enable debug logs. Look, look, look there. Uh, so what are the typical ways of uh, debugging problems like to, in order to learn that SSD, for example, is offline because it cannot contact the remote server. Just as a random example, but it could be like any other problem. So we just talked about this with Fabiano over lunch, that our debugging is very suboptimal. <laughs> and yes. currently, uh, you need to debug, enable the debug level in all the SSD conf sections and just look there. Uh, we have on the SSD wiki, wiki, we have a troubleshooting guide 
which might help you. I'm not sure if you saw that. And what we did in the last two or three releases, we have a command light tool that is called SSS control. And that tool has su uh, have, uh, sub commands. One of that sub commands <coughs> is, I think, domain status or domain info. Uh, that, that would show you domain is offline. Uh, uh, another command there is something like user status or user show. I don't remember the commands precisely. And this would show you, for example, when was the last time that the user was refreshed from LDAP. So this tool maybe can be used. There. Uh, do SSSD support transitive trust relationships? No. Only WinBank can do this. Because, uh, repeat the question. Does SSSD support transitive trust? Uh, no. Uh, Somewhere in the backlog, and maybe it is something that Andreas might work on someday, no? <laughs> <laughs> but if I understand it correctly, and maybe Volker can help me, but uh, I think, uh, so SSD, if it's... We need better with integration with SSD. Yes, yes. We need this phone calls again. <laughs> yes. Uh, so if SSD is joined to an Active Directory domain, it has credentials only from that domain, right? a kitab that represents the uh, machine account. And time is up, I will just finish this one answer. And that kitab cannot be used to authenticate or to even to authenticate you against directory servers in another forest. Uh, I think WinBind does this by the private, uh, the Windows RPC calls. We don't. We, we just ask how to make them for, for authentication. Okay. Yes, but we do that over a network. Right. Okay. And SSD only uses LDAP and Kerberos and... Yeah. And that's not possible. Yeah. There were some phone calls we had maybe one, two years ago where we talked about splitting some parts of WinBind and making them reusable, but nobody did the work. <laughs> yeah. We need to revise that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, guys. Time is up. Thank you very much for listening.